Thank you, Brian. Uh, hello, everybody. Yes, I'm the artistic director here at the theater. Um, it's a little late in the day to be doing this, but I didn't want the moment to go by without saying welcome to our home. Um, we're really happy to have you all here. Um, I've gotten to know a little bit more about Ted as, as uh, you know, going through this process with these folks and heard this tagline that uh, Ted is uh, a theater of ideas. And I would say that any theater worth, worth its salt would also call itself a theater of ideas, and we here at Two River do. Um, I have something that I want to talk, talk to you about just in terms of this notion of play and how that relates to what we do in the theater. But first of all, because I have you as a captive audience, I want to learn a few things about who you all are. So how many of you has ever seen a play here at Two River Theater Company? Wow, okay, pretty good. How many of you uh, has, comes regularly as a subscriber to the Two River Theater Company? All right, good. So I'm employing all of you to get out the word to the rest of these people here that you have one of the greatest resources, artistic resources, uh, in this place, in this building. Um, and everybody here should be a subscriber, should come to every single show. You're a fool not to. I promise you. Yes. Um, and I'm not saying that just because just I'm the artistic director. I happen to know this is true. It's been true since this theater began, that uh, this theater is an institute of art. We create art here. We are a nonprofit institution. We do not, uh, we do not perform plays that you would see on Broadway necessarily for the same reasons that people would do them on Broadway, which is to convince you to spend $150 uh, and for them to make a profit. We are a nonprofit theater. We prioritize making art over profit. That's what we do here. Um, and, and we, abs yes. Um, and so we need people like yourselves. Um, for the place to existed, exist at all, we needed a visionary. Um, and we had two that, uh, I don't know if you knew, you had two extraordinary vis visionaries in your midst 20 years ago. Uh, the people for whom this, built, this uh, theater is named, who built this building with a vision to bring great art to this community because they felt like you all deserved it. And they continue to do it every single day and year. And they're here right now, I see them. I didn't know they were coming. But uh, Bob Recknitz and Joan Recknitz. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me just talk to you about this thing I want to talk to you about today. Because um, when I hear the word play, of course, you might imagine I think of something very different from what I think most of you think about, right? Um, and, uh, and because I work in the theater where we are still basically uh, using techniques that we began using in 500 BC in Greece. I'm not all that high tech. I've never learned how to use PowerPoint, so I use paper, all right? Um, and I'm gonna tell you um, the thing that I think about when I hear th the word play, I think first is what you all think about. And I looked it up in the dictionary to see what is the first definition that we come across when we see the word play as a verb. And Webster's tells us that it is to engage in an activity of imaginative pretense. And I think, yes, that's right. That's what we do or what we watch happen when children play in playgrounds, right? We watch animals play. If you are like me, you love those shows on PBS, those nature shows where you watch the mother lion go off and kill the gazelle while the kids are watching. And then she sits back and watches the kids play at that too, right? They are playing, learning how to be stealthy and, uh, and learning how to take down their, uh, their prey as they play with each other there. Um, and also we watch that happen in sports that there's this imaginative pretense that the athletes are living under and that they are like those children and like those animals, that they are playing at something that teaches them skills that they can put to good use in their real lives, right? This is a good reason, we've, we've talked about this today, how we transfer those skills of play into our, into our lives. And I would say that, uh, that the theater does something similar. And I don't think it's a coincidence of linguistics or philology that the word play that you all first think about is also at the center of what we do. We in the theater here, as you know, we produce right here something called plays. We bring in these people who do this thing and they play. They are players, they are actors. 
And what they are playing out in the same way that those animals are learning skills for killing other animals, and children are learning things about how to play cops from how to play cops and robbers and learning things about communication and all of that. What we do here is we play and practice how to be a human being. We practice our humanity. And we invite you in every single night to practice that with us, to get better at that as we play it up here. We want you to get better too, just like we want to, because I believe, as we all do, that we all want to be better than we actually are. And how are we going to do that? We have these imaginative leaps that we need to be making all, a lot of the time with these artists who are asking us to play with them, right? Um, I remember as a kid, I, 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 like many of us, I'm sure, I grew up thinking about some of these things, partly because of the luck of my circumstances. I grew up in Boston. Um, and in a time and a place where my mother was somebody who could say to us kids, go out and play. And we'd go out all day and we'd play. And we'd play marbles and we'd play cops and robbers and whatever else. But also because I was off and running this, we'd make up plays and we'd put on shows, <laughs> right? And we did this as part of play. Um, I also had the great good fortune of being uh, raised in a very sporty family. My uncle is one of the greatest college basketball coaches living today, a guy called Jim Calhoun, who took the Yukon Huskies to three national championships. But my good luck was that when I was growing up in Boston, he was the coach at Northeastern University. So we went to every single game and watched his team play. And I remember the time that he said, we, he was talking to me about how he coaches, and he said that he talks to his players with his coaches, and they write plays for the players. And having been a kid devoted to theater, I thought, wow, that sounds just like what we do in the theater. Isn't that amazing? Um, and, but those kids, those players, are learning skills, uh, learning skills about offense and defense and how to move around and all kinds of things that they can then use in their lives in other ways. Realize we in the theater were doing the same thing. I also in Boston um, was lucky enough to grow up in a place where theater happened. So I found my way towards theater. And I found, I remember the day sitting in a theater watching a play, feeling the same thing in the theater that I would feel at the basketball games. That but because of what I was watching and leaning forward, my heart was beating faster. My muscles ached as if I was actually doing the thing that those people were up there doing. I was completely engaged in that play. Um, so play of all kinds allows us to establish some safe spaces and boundaries and rules where we can practice the skills for making ourselves better human beings, right? We do that as kids, we, and we do that as adults, I think, in the theater. Animals and children play as they practice their lives for adults. Sport allows us to play out, play out our aggressions, our stratagems, thrills, and then theater is the place where we practice our humanity. Uh, we watch people play out their dilemmas and their struggles and their joys and their triumphs. That's what we do when we come here. Um, and these people are playing and you guys are watching. And there's an amazing potency that is at the heart of that there that leads to some amazing surprises. I had one of my greatest surprises as a theater producer right here in this very building I've um, been working, as, as Brian said, I worked at the Public Theater for uh, 12 years. I, I then produced some shows on Broadway and uh, started another theater company off Broadway. Been in New York theater working for 20 years. But I had this experience here that I will never forget. And it's, it's to do with what I'm talking about. We produced a brand new play, um, a musical called In This House. I don't know if any of you saw this, this musical. Um, it's a sweet chamber musical that we did in our smaller theater. Uh, our Marion Huber Theater, which is a 110-seat theater. We set the theater up with the audience on three sides, and the players and the playing space were kind of in the middle. Uh, and this was a musical about two couples, two straight couples, one about to be married and about sort of to, to step over and out onto that precipice of their married lives. The other, an older couple, right at the very end of their time together, having been married for a very long time. And these two couples meet quite unexpectedly. It's very odd, that, but they meet up and they spend an evening together and we spend that evening with them in the theater. And we watch, surprisingly, that these, these two couples teach each other things, that they're surprised that the other can teach them about what it means to be in love and what it means to be married. And they go on this, for lack of a better word, incredible emotional journey of self-understanding and it's very, very moving, very beautiful, and some exquisitely beautiful music, and music that does that thing that swells and takes you and moves you to other places. It was really, any, anybody who saw it, I think, would agree. Yes, an amazing thing. But, 
But here's what was incredible for me. I watched the show most nights. Early on in the run, um, I was sitting. I told you we, we had the seats arranged in this three-quarter round. So wherever you're sitting at any point watching the play, you can look across the play and see somebody else in the audience and see someone else's face and see what's happening. One night early in the run, I was there, and I looked across while the show was happening early in the play, and I saw this woman. She was probably about 80 years old, her hair tight in a bun, beautifully, subtly, judiciously made up, wonderful face, a nice sweater set, a set of pearls, and on her lap was her purse and her clenched hands. And I watched her, I noticed her across the play, she seemed to be alone, and I saw this scowl on her face as the play was proceeding. And I thought, oh God, she hates it. Um, you know, one of the worst things for a producer to feel, but all right, I'll get over it, I thought, and I'll just watch the play. I do, I get incredibly moved, as I did every single night, and at the end of the play, when the last four bars of the music swells, and you hear the old couple finally understand what it means to see each other for the first time, incredibly moving, beautiful, beautiful thing, very painful, this beautiful music that swells you out, I happened to look across, and there she was, my woman with her pearls and her clenched, uh, clenched fist, tears streaming down her face. That makeup riven with lo the lines of her tears. It was kind of amazing. I thought, wow, huh, that's surprising. Uh, but then I, I walked out of the theater and I, I got to the, the door, the exit door, and uh, I was talking with somebody and I feel this tap on my shoulder. And I turn around and there she is. Never met her in my life. Um, and, but there she stands. She grabbed my hands and she said, I have never cried in public. I will never be the same again. And she just walked out the door. And I thought, yeah. I thought that's the power of this play that we can do. That's the effect that we can have on somebody's life. Um, I'm, God, I'm, I'm taking much more time than I said I was going to. But, um, but I just wanted also to say that I'm not the first person to have this idea of how a play works and what a play can do. Uh, somebody much smarter than I, um, who was working in the theater about 415 year old, 50 years, 15 years ago, uh, a guy you might know called William Shakespeare, wrote a play you might have heard of called Hamlet. Um, and in that play, Shakespeare gets to speak, I think, one of his great obsessions. He's obsessed with this potency that a play can have and, and the, the potential danger that can be involved in an audience getting that kind of engaged with what's going on on stage. It's incredibly potent. Hamlet gets to speak one of the most beautiful things that he says. If you remember the plot from ninth grade English history class, you remember Hamlet's the, the, the college kid um, who comes home to the castle uh, to attend his father's funeral. His father has just died. And, uh, and also, he, at, right after the funeral, he goes to his mother's wedding. His mother has married his father's brother, his uncle, and this distresses him as it might anybody. Um, but then he's particularly distressed, of course, because he's now seeing the vision of his father. The ghost of his father is coming to him regularly and saying, you must avenge my death. I was murdered by this man, the ghost is saying. And Hamlet doesn't know whether to believe this or not. He thinks he might be going crazy. But, as luck would have it, a, a group of players comes rolling through the castle, and they're going to put on an entertainment for the king and the queen. And Hamlet has an idea, and he says, I know I can use, I can exploit the play. I can use the theater. And so he writes a play for the players where he's going to show in this play a, man, a king who is killed by his brother. And he says, if my mother and uncle, if they lean in, and if they see themselves in that moment, then I know they did it. Then I know that they will tell me their truth in their faces. So he gets the actors to put on this play. But he tells them how to do it in this very famous speech uh, called Advice to the Players. And he says, suit the action to the word, the word to the action, with this special observance that you o'erstep not the modesty of nature. For anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was and is to hold the mirror, as it were, to hold the mirror up to nature, to show virtue her own features, scorn her own image, and the very age and body of the time, his form and pressure. This mirror of the theater, if you tell it truthfully, will tell the truth to these people of who they are. 
That's Shakespeare knowing something very powerful 415 years ago. We continue to know this truth. We have some amazing artists that we work with all the time who also know this truth. I just want to uh, tell you uh, uh, one, uh, my, my old boss and mentor, a fabulous theater uh, artist called George C. Wolfe. Uh, many of you might know him as a director. He directed the Pulitzer Prize winning and Tony Award winning Angels in America, which was you know, earth shattering uh, for the American theater. He also wrote a play called uh, Colored Museum. He ran the public theater for 12 years when I was there. Uh, he says this thing repeatedly, which I just love, and it sort of feels like why I do what I do. He says, theater is people in the dark watching people in the light celebrate how wonderful and painful it is to be a human being. He says, when theater affects you, you lean forward and you can see yourself being embodied. I love that. Just lastly, if I could just finish with, with something else uh, that I also love, and I'm running out of time. But, um, but there's an, another, the, the play and theater can, can uh, be manifest in many different ways. There was a marvelous play a number of years ago, some of you may have seen, starring Lily Tomlin called The Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. A solo show, a single solo performance, but a play nonetheless. Um, and this was, uh, if you don't know it, if you know Lily Tomlin, you will know sort of what it's, what it's like. But it's a play about a number of characters. Um, and Lily Tomlin plays these different characters. Uh, and it's about looking for intelligence in the world, essentially. Um, one of the characters that Lily Tomlin plays is a bag lady called Trudy. And Trudy lives in Times Square. And she is a, a, a she, you know, she wouldn't think she is. But to most of us, she looks a little crazy. She's a bag lady. Um, and, uh, but she insists she's not crazy because she says that her job is to act as a special consultant to this troop of aliens who have recently come to Earth to try to discover if there is any intelligent life here. And as a special consultant, she feels like she has certain things that she has to do. So one day she takes all these aliens to a Broadway play, right? Okay, so having done that, she then says to us, the audience, she says, did I tell you what happened at the play? We, we were at the back of the theater, standing there in the dark, when all of a sudden, I feel one of them tug at my sleeve, and he whispers, Trudy, look. I said, yeah, goosebumps. You definitely got goosebumps. You like the play that much, I said. And they said, it wasn't the play that gave him the goosebumps, it was the audience. I forgot to tell them, she says, to watch the play. They'd been watching the audience. Yeah, to see a group of people sitting together in the dark, laughing and crying at the same things, well, that just knocked them out. They said, Trudy, the play was soup. The audience, art. So they, the aliens, they're, they're taking the goosebumps back with them into space. Goosebumps, quite a souvenir. I like to think of them out there in the dark, watching us. Sometimes we'll do something and they'll laugh. Sometimes we'll do something and they'll cry. And maybe one day we'll do something so magnificent the whole universe will get goosebumps. Thank you for listening. Hope to see you back in the theater.